Our scripture reading this evening is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians from chapter 2. We read the second half of that chapter from verse 11 to verse 22. If you're new to looking at the Bible, then Paul's letter to the Ephesians is found after the four Gospels and Acts and Romans, the two letters to the Corinthians, and then you come to a little letter to the Galatians and then Ephesians. Let us hear God's word together. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Amen. May God bless to us and help us to understand and apply the reading of his holy word. Well, as Sinclair said, we're looking these Sunday evenings at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And those of you who've been coming here on Sunday mornings will know that Paul spent almost three years in Ephesus. Read about that in Acts chapter 19. And for two or more of those years, he had discussions daily in one of the city lecture halls. One of the Greek manuscripts of Acts adds that Paul did this instructing from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's the hottest part of the day when most people, I guess, were having a siesta, resting from their work. Five hours, six days a week, for two years. That's a lot of lecture discussion. You know, that's more than most of our students who are doing an honours degree, would have university these days. And here's Paul writing to the Christian believers in Ephesus, a few years later, telling them what's involved in being a Christian and how they should be living as Christians. Now, granted, some of them have become Christians since Paul had left, but surely a good number of them must have They must have known what Paul was going to be writing about. They must have heard it several times. 
But you know, there's a big difference between hearing some particular truths and understanding and living by those very truths. And a good teacher keeps on repeating the truths until they've sunk in. There's a very interesting couple of verses in Peter's second letter. Listen to what he says. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in this tent of this body. I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. So, it's really important that we keep on hearing these truths of the gospel until they become part of us. In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul has reminded these believers of the amazing grace of God. This amazing grace that's lavished upon them so many blessings. God has blessed them with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And they mustn't tire of hearing that, nor must we. In the second chapter, we saw last time, Paul reminds them of the tremendous transformation that took place when they became Christian believers. Before they heard and responded to the gospel, they were, he says in verse 1, dead in their transgressions and sins. Well, of course, their bodies were alive. They were breathing and they were moving around. But as far as their relationship with God was concerned, they were dead, stone dead, not a flicker of life. But then, he tells us, simply out of his great love for them, not because they deserved it at all, God did something. He made them alive in Christ. That means he forgave their sins through Jesus' death on the cross. He restored them into this living relationship with God. And as a result... Paul said, they are God's workmanship, God's work of art, created to do good works. Now that, of course, applied to all the Christians there at Ephesus. It applies to all of us who are Christians today. Before we became Christians, we too were dead in our sins. We became Christians by God in his grace making us alive in Christ, incorporating us into Christ, forgiving us and accepting us. And we too are God's workmanship, God's work of art to do good deeds. Now, in the second half of this chapter, which we look at tonight, to show that he was a good teacher, Paul repeats himself. He says the same thing in a slightly different way. Before we look at it in detail, we need to realize that the world in those days was divided into two groups of people. There were the Jews, God's chosen people, They had all their traditions. They had the Old Testament scriptures. They had their temple there in Jerusalem. But of course, they spread throughout the world now. And in most places in the Roman Empire, they had their meeting places or synagogues where they met each Sabbath to read their scriptures. And then all the non-Jews were collectively known as the Gentiles. And these two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, didn't have a lot of time for each other. They had little love or respect for one another. And amazingly, Paul, who'd been brought up as a strict Jew, had received a very clear commission from the Lord to take the gospel to the Gentiles. 
And this he'd done. In several places, he'd seen Jews and Gentiles united in their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. But of course, in a place like Ephesus, the majority of the Christians would be Gentiles. And so at this point in his letter, it seems that Paul turns and he addresses specifically the Gentile Christians. Now, like the Jews, they too were dead in their sins. They too had been made alive in Christ. And they too were God's workmanship. But there were other things true about them as well. And Paul wants to remind them of these things. Now, I don't know everybody in church tonight. But I'd be surprised if there were more than a few, two or three, Jewish Christians here in our church tonight. I mean, people who were brought up as Jews and have now become Christians. They've believed into Jesus. There maybe aren't any. We're all here Gentiles. And so what Paul says is really very relevant for us tonight. In verses 11 and 12, Paul is saying to them, Remember what you once were. Remember what you once were. You'll see the word remember. He uses in verse 11 and in verse 12. You see, not only were they dead in their sins like the Jews, they were also, he says this in verse 13, they were also far away. They were far away from God. They were far away from all the privileges that the Jews enjoyed. We had Scott and Nock Murray with us in church this morning. They live far away from us normally on the other side of the world, in Thailand. Suppose we lived a few hundred years ago, before there were emails. That would have have been okay, wouldn't it? Anyway, before there were emails, before there were telephones, before there were aeroplanes, Scott and Not really would have been far away then, wouldn't they? We maybe never see them. These Gentiles were far away from God. And in verse 12, Paul expands on what that means in three areas. First, he says, they were far away because they were separate from Christ. Now, Christ is the word for the Messiah, the anointed one. Throughout their history, the Jews were looking forward to, they were expecting the, the, the coming of the promised Messiah. That's one reason for all the fuss on, on Palm Sunday. They, they reckoned the promised king had come. They had this great hope that one day God was going to intervene and set up his king on his throne. And at various times through their history, this was a great encouragement to them. The king was coming. God wasn't going to abandon them. A better day was in store. Ah, but the Gentiles had no such Christ Messiah to look forward to. They were separate from Christ. So not only were they dead in their sins, dead in their relation to God, they had no hope of things ever being any different. They were far away. They had no great goal to live for. They were purposeless, we could say. Secondly, Paul says they're far away because they were excluded from citizenship in Israel and were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. 
Israel was a nation, a commonwealth under God, a theocracy, a people to whom God had bound himself in covenant to be their God and they to be his people. The Jews were citizens of that nation, subjects of that covenant people. The Gentiles were not. They were excluded from citizenship of that nation. They were foreigners to the covenant. They had no place amongst God's people. We could say they were rootless. And thirdly, Paul says, They were far away because they were without hope and without God in the world. See, the Jews knew that God the Lord was their God. They knew he was with them. He knew that he was concerned for them. Gentiles had no hope that God was interested in them. No hope that things might turn out better for them. They were without God. Oh yes, God had had revealed himself in nature and left not left himself without witness. But they continually suppressed the truth and turned instead to idolatry. Oh, they had their so-called gods, but they didn't have the living and true God. The golden age of The Greeks was past. They had no promised future to look forward to. They really were hopeless. Remember what you once were, says Paul. As well as being dead in your sins like everybody else. You were also far away. Separate from Christ. Purposeless. Excluded from God's people, rootless, without hope and without God, hopeless. And weren't we in exactly the same position before we were Christians? Not only were we dead in our sins, we too were far away. We too were separate from Christ. See, more and more these days, we have people coming around the church who don't have even a Christian home or upbringing. They have no great goal to look forward to, no prospect of God intervening and setting up his kingdom in their lives. They're purposeless. We too were excluded from citizenship of God's nation, from being part of God's people. Worse than that, Many of us had rebelled against God's authority. We were wandering around aimlessly, rootless. And we too were without hope and without God. Oh yes, the world offered us lots of things. And we were hopeful of getting a good job and getting on in life and having lots of material things. Yeah, that's great. Some of us made to try to make gods of these things, of possessions and money. But it all came to nothing, really. We were hopeless. And Paul says to them and to us, remember, remember what you once were. Remember what it was like to be so purposeless. Remember what it was like to be rootless. Remember what it was like to be so hopeless. I might be wondering why Paul goes on about this. Why does he want them to remember the past? Well, if they remembered how bad things were, then they'd realize how good things were now and how great is God's grace that can bring about such a transformation. Remember what you once were. Secondly, Verses 13 to 18. Recognize what Jesus has done. Recognize what Jesus has done. Now in the first section, after telling them they were dead in their sins, Paul said in verse 4, But God, but God made you alive with Christ. In this section, Paul uses the same word but in verse 13 
But now, and again he goes on to tell them what God had done. Look what he says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. You've been brought near. Now this language of far away and brought near was not uncommon language in the Old Testament. God and Israel were known to be near one another since God had promised to be their God and to make them his people. Moses could say, what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? But Gentile nations were far away. But now, but now, not only have they been made alive to God, they've been brought near to God. And in verse 13... Paul hints at how this has happened. Notice he uses the phrase, in Christ Jesus. And that refers to their conversion to Christ, their incorporation into Christ. And he also uses the phrase, through the blood of Christ. And that refers to the historical event of the cross. God has brought you near, Paul saying, by incorporating you into Christ and through the cross of Christ. But Paul, how how has the cross of Christ brought us near? Well, Paul explains that in verse 14. Look what he says. He himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What's he on about? Well, we ought to help us understand what Paul's saying. We need to take a trip to Jerusalem at that time. And we need to go there, and we need to visit the magnificent temple there in Jerusalem. It's constructed on an elevated platform. Around around the main temple building is the court of the priests. East of this, there's the court of Israel. Further east is the court of the women. These three courts are all on the same level as the temple itself. From this level, we go down five steps to a walled platform. And then down another 14 steps to another wall beyond which is the outer court, the court of the Gentiles. It's a very spacious court. It surrounds, runs right around the temple and these other courts. And from any part of this court, the Gentiles can look up and can view the temple. But they're not allowed to approach it. They're cut off by this surrounding wall four and a half feet high and on this wall at regular intervals are displayed warning notices in Greek and in Latin saying not trespassers will be prosecuted but trespassers will be executed now we thought about this morning didn't we we were thinking about Paul in the temple and being accused of taking Gentiles into the temple. And it caused a riot. Is that serious? Now that's the barrier. That's the dividing wall keeping out Gentiles that Paul's referring to here. And he's saying that when Jesus died on the cross, he brought us near by not only making peace between us and God, but also by destroying that barrier, breaking down the wall that separates us from the people of God. Now, of course, when Paul wrote this letter, that wall, that barrier was still standing there in the temple in Jerusalem. It wasn't actually broken down 
until AD 70 when the Roman legions entered Jerusalem. But although it remained materially, spiritually it had been destroyed in AD 30 when Jesus died on the cross. Remember the time of the cross? That great curtain of the temple barring the Holy of Holies from anyone but the high priest once a year. That was, that was torn in two when Jesus died on the cross. But in the same way, this, this barri- bar- barrier, this wall, was destroyed as well. But how did Jesus do that, Paul? How did the death of Jesus on the cross destroy that barrier and so make the two people one? Well, Paul tells us in verses 15 and 16. Jesus did this by, one, abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. But Paul, how can you say that Christ abolished the law when Christ himself, on the Sermon on the Mount, said that he'd come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Well, if we, think, if we think of the ceremonial law, first of all, things like circumcision, sacrifices, dietary requirements, and so on, these commandments and regulations did create a very real barrier between Jews and Gentiles. <clears throat> Jesus did abolish these, In his flesh, it says. That's surely a reference to his death. Because on the cross, Jesus fulfilled all the types and shadows of this Old Testament ceremonial system. If we think of the moral law, say the Ten Commandments, it's divisive because we cannot obey that law, however hard we try. And so it separates us from God and from each other. But Jesus perfectly obeyed that law in his life and in his death on the cross he bore the consequences of our disobedience. He took upon himself the curse of the law in order to free us from it. So Jesus did abolish it as a way of salvation. Acceptance with God is now through faith in Christ crucified alone, whether Jews or Gentiles. So Jesus' death destroyed the barrier by abolishing both the regulations of the ceremonial law and the condemnation of the moral law. Two, Jesus' death destroyed the barrier by creating one new man out of two. See, once the law was abolished, there was nothing to keep the two parts of humanity, Jews and Gentiles, apart. So Christ brought them together by an act of creation, literally, He created the two into one new man, so making peace. The new man is the Christian community viewed corporately. A new human race, united by Jesus himself. Potentially it was created when Jesus abolished the law on the cross. Actually it comes into existence and grows by personal union with Christ. In fact, in other places, Paul expands on this. He tells us this unity does more than span the the Jew-Gentile divide. It does away with sexual and social distinctions. Paul speaks in Galatians of there being neither Jews nor Greeks, slave or free, male or female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Oh, not that human differentiations are removed, but inequalities are abolished. 
And then Jesus' death destroyed the barrier three by, he says, reconciling Jews and Gentiles to God. After the abolition of the law and the creation of an undivided humanity comes the reconciliation of both parts of the old humanity to God by which he put to death their hostility. He's talking about hostility between God and men. There's man's attitude of rebellion to God and there's God's wrath against men because of their sin. And through the cross, both hostilities have been brought to an end. Christ bore our sin and judgment and God turned away his wrath. So Christ put to death the hostility. So that's how the death of Jesus on the cross has destroyed the barrier that divides us. By his death, Jesus has abolished the law as a divisive instrument, separating men from God and Jews from Gentiles. He's created a new, a single new humanity out of its former divisions. And he's reconciled this new united humanity to God having killed through the cross all the hostility between us. He's brought into being nothing less than a new, united human race, united in itself and united to its creator. So that's the first thing God did to bring us near. He sent his son to the cross to destroy the dividing wall and bring about this, bring into being this new humanity. You know, this week, through this week at our lunchtime services, we're going to be thinking a lot about the cross. Perhaps it's significant that tonight we can begin to think about it because it's so central to what Jesus has done for us. The second thing that God did to bring us near was to incorporate us into Christ. Now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. And that has come about through the preaching of this peace. Look at verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, peace to those who were near, Jews. Now, since this preaching comes after the cross, it must refer to Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. It must refer to the proclamation of the gospel by the apostles and subsequently. Now, Paul doesn't spell it out here, but we know from other texts in the New Testament that the way that Christ the way that what Christ has done on the cross, the way that's made real to us, and the way that we are incorporated into Christ is by the Holy Spirit taking the preached word and bringing saving faith to birth in us. Faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. And the evidence that that's happened, that we are in Christ, is in verse 18. We both, Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by the one Spirit. So Paul's saying, recognize what the Lord has done. He's brought you near through Christ's death on the cross and he's brought you into Christ. Jesus' death has destroyed the barriers and created a new humanity. You are now in Christ through the preaching of that word. Isn't that fantastic? What more could the Lord have done for us? And then thirdly, Paul goes on, remember what you once were, recognize what 
the Lord has done. Thirdly, realize what you have become. Verses 19 to 22. In the first section, remember verse 10, Paul says, For you are God's workmanship. You're God's work of art. Here he says, verse 19, Consequently, as a result of what Jesus has done, he says your status has changed dramatically. You now belong in a new way, in a way you never did before. You've come home. And he expands on that by saying that they've become part of the church. And he gives them three pictures of what that means. So first he wants them to realize that they've become part of God's kingdom. You're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. He's thinking there about being a citizen of God's kingdom. He's not thinking about a territorial kingdom. He's not thinking even of a spiritual structure. God's kingdom is God himself ruling his people and giving them all the privileges and responsibilities which his rule implies. And to this God-ruled community, Jews and Gentiles belong on equal terms. See, here's Paul writing at the height of the Roman Empire. But he sees another kingdom, more splendid, more enduring than any earthly kingdom. And he rejoices in the citizenship of this kingdom even more than his Roman citizenship. Citizens of this kingdom are free and secure, no longer rootless, but stable and secure. You're part of God's kingdom, he says. You really belong. Secondly, Paul wants them to realize that they become part of God's family. Verse 19b says, members of God's household. Becoming part of a kingdom is one thing. Becoming part of a family, well, that's another thing altogether, isn't it? In Christ, Jews and Gentiles are more than fellow citizens of God, under God's rule. They are together children in God's family. He just mentioned in the previous verse about having access to the Father. Earlier in chapter 1, he spelled out some of the blessings of being adopted into God's family. And here, he's, I think, he's thinking about the brotherhood into which they'd been brought. A brotherhood across racial barriers. You know, brethren, brothers and sisters, is the commonest word for Christians in the New Testament. We're brothers and sisters. It expresses a close relationship of affection and care and support. Brotherly love should be the, character, the characteristic of God's new society. Paul saying you belong to a family. And thirdly, Paul wants them to realize that they've become part of God's temple. 20 to 22 temple there in Jerusalem had been the focal point of Israel's history for nearly a thousand years. But now there's a new people, not a nation, a new humanity worldwide. So, a geographically located building wouldn't be appropriate. No, no, the temple that the focus of unity is now the church this company of people who believe in and belong to Jesus look what he says about the about this temple he speaks about its foundations of apostles and prophets he's talking about the new testament scripture surely and like any foundation these can't be tampered with or changed by additions or subtractions or modifications. The cornerstone, 
crucial to any building, is Christ Jesus himself. He holds the growing temple together as a unity. The individual stones, well, these are the individual church members. In him, you too are being built together. You too there refers to Gentile believers. They've been forbidden to enter the Jerusalem temple. But now they're not only admitted, they're a constituent part of it. And what's the purpose of this temple? Well, like the old temple, to be a dwelling place of God. This is where God dwells. This is where God makes his home. Not a building. God's not tied to holy buildings, but to holy people. He lives in them, individually and as a community. Paul's wanting them to realize that they've become part of this new temple, this community in which God lives by his Spirit. Here's where they really belong. Just think of Paul dictating this letter. And there, in his mind's eye, he can see Ephesus. And he can see that magnificent marble temple of Artemis, Diana. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There it is with its statues, great statue of the goddess. And there in Jerusalem, also in his mind's eye, he can see the Jewish temple built by Herod the Great, this one, barricading itself against the Gentiles and against God. Two temples, one pagan, one Jewish, each designed as a divine residence, but both empty of the living God. But now there's this new temple, a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit, his new society, his redeemed people scattered around the world. They are his home on earth. And that temple rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. It's going to be God's home in heaven. On that day, a voice from the throne will declare, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. Gentile Christians, he's saying, realize what you've become. Part of God's kingdom, the kingdom over which God rules, part of the family which God loves, part of the temple in which God lives. That's where you belong. Your home. Isn't that fantastic? And all that's true for us. Despite what I was, far away from God, purposeless, rootless, hopeless, Christ died for me to bring me near. He's removed all the barriers. He's created a new humanity. He's reconciled me to others and to God. And he's brought me home to where I really belong. Far away, brought near, brought home. Great to be a Christian, you know. It's fantastic. And I need to ask you tonight, are you far away from God? Are you purposeless and rootless and hopeless? Or you might be a regular church attender. You might never have been here before. Are you feeling far away tonight? 
You are far away, aren't you? Well, listen, we're reminded of it this very week in the Christian year. Jesus died on a cross. Jesus, the Son of God, died on a cross. And he died for you. He died to bring you near. He died to destroy all the barriers that are keeping you out. He died to reconcile you to himself and to other Christians. He died in order to bring you into Christ as you trust in him. And you know, when that happens, you too become part of God's kingdom and part of God's family and part of God's temple. But we need to trust into Christ to do that. We need to admit that we are far away. And that's hard for some of us. But we need to admit that we're far away from God. We need to believe that Jesus on the cross did all that for me. We need to ask him to bring us into Christ as we trust in him. And then we just need to enter into these wonderful privileges of belonging. Do you know there'd be no better time to do that than Easter week? Wouldn't there? In fact, there'd be no better time to do that than tonight. Why wait till Friday or Saturday or Sunday? 